Welcome back to Crit and Grit. I'm Axion. I'm Sit. And we are continuing our playthrough of Mario Adventure and our discussion of Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen. You know who gets even less focus in this story than the, than the title character? The character we forgot to mention when we were going over the characters last episode? Exactly! But that's okay, because this episode's going to be all about the devil and his mirror. Some translations simply call the creature a goblin, a troll, other things, but my translation straight up said... There was a troll, and this troll was the devil. And this is where the story actually begins. Not with Kai and Gerda, not with the Snow Queen, but with the devil. Yep, mine is... I uh, refer to him as a wicked hobgoblin. He was one of the very worst, for he was a real demon. It's really interesting how different these translations make them. Well, they, like, the gist is the same, but there are so, so many subtle nuance changes. Yep. The primary influence, while the, while the devil is only present in the first section of the story, his influence lasts throughout the tale through the effect of the magic mirror that he creates. And at the beginning of the story, we are introduced to this mirror, and it's described as a mirror that shows in its reflection the worst traits of of whatever it reflects magnified and their most benign traits diminished. So, Which is why I, I keep saying Troll is very accurate because he gives you the YouTube comment filter. I mean, not wrong. Hi YouTube, how's it going? <laughs> And we're, we're actually pretty lucky, I guess mostly part of being a small channel, that we see, we see very few nasty comments, but we all know that YouTube is kind of infamous for the comment section being a trash fire I in a lot of places. Yeah. Why am I the one making that joke? I don't even like Star Wars that much. Because it's appropriate, and it's a well-known yeah, cultural phase. Yeah, I just phase. meant, why did I say it, not you? You're the Star Wars fan. Uh, because you thought of it before I did. Ah. But anyway, um... Yeah. Um, so, here's how my translation describes the mirror. He made a looking glass which had the power of making everything good or beautiful that was reflected in it almost shrink to nothing, while everything that was worthless and bad increased in size and worse than ever. The most lovely landscapes appeared like boiled spinach, and the people became hideous and looked as if they stood on their heads and had no bodies. Their countenances were so distorted that no one could recognize them, and even one freckle on the face appeared to spread over the whole of the nose and mouth. When a good or pious thought passed through the mind of anyone, it was misrepresented in the glass, and how the demon laughed at his cunning invention. Which, that's a cultural thing that has really changed. Uh, freckles are not so much a uh, ew, ugly thing these days. At least in my experience, most people tend to regard freckles as more cute. Yep, and uh, my best understanding of the freckles thing, it was classism. Yeah, I can see that. Because who would be able to keep out of the sun all day? People who didn't have to work. People who could stay inside, in the shade, wearing big old fancy hats that wouldn't get in the way of work. So, yeah, classism. Yeah, no what? That, that makes sense. It's honestly interesting how many stories have, like, freckles in them as, like, a plot point. Like, I remember there was part of Anne of Green Gables where she was desperately trying to, like, lemon juice or bleach her freckles away. Didn't work. 
stupid fish! But, yeah, it's just... It is the mirror of make everything awful. Made for the amusement of a demon whose job it is to make everything terrible. So, of course, he'd like it. Yep. And this demon, as demons are wont to do, falls victim to his own hubris when, after having a great deal of fun with using this mirror to look at terrible things and see how terrible they are and look at good things and see how terrible it makes them, he decides that it's a brilliant idea to take the glass up to heaven. Uh, some translations simply say to look at the angels, some translations straight up say look at God. Which, uh, that's what my translation says. I hate you, fish. However, because, as things are wont to do, at high altitudes, things get cold. The mirror gets cold and slippery, and eventually falls from the demon's grasp, and... When it falls, it shatters into a million pieces. As a result of this, sections of the mirror are scattered all over the world. Some are in fairly large chunks and are found and are used by people, completely unaware of their nature, for making glass things. Glass eyeglasses, window panes. Anything you would use a big chunk of glass for. And the story hints at how doing so would cause anyone who looks through these bits of glass to have the same influence upon whatever they see as looking in the mirror would have. But then it talks about the small shards, whose effect is in many ways worse than the bigger pieces. Which is a common storytelling thing of the tiniest piece is a greater danger than the large, obvious thing. And... As a result of their small size, these shards can become lodged in a person's body, primarily in their eye or in their heart. And we discussed the effects of that back when we were talking about the story. Sint, do you have yeah, anything like, I, you want to add before I move on? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I still maintain, I think the uh, little hobgoblin troll, whatever the heck we're calling him, has more impact on the story than the Snow Queen who gives the story its title. Yep. He is the source of everything that happens in the story. He's just not mentioned as much. Even the Snow Queen gets more screen time. But yes, his influence is most certainly the greatest on the actual results of the plot. Because every time the mirror is mentioned, and every time the shards are mentioned, that is his influence continuing to stretch over the story. Yep. Like, he directly causes everything. The Snow Queen is literally just there for the ride. Like, literally, she's only in the story because... Kai hitches a ride on her sleigh because it's a fun game, and doesn't realize whose it is. Yep. So what we end up with is... Kai with these fragments in his eyes, and his, his eye in his heart, and... All of that completely changes his behavior, it completely alters how he interacts with the world, and it changes how the story unfolds with regards to him. It could be argued that if 
Kai had never been struck by one or even both of the shards, the story would never have happened. Oh, it wouldn't, because this only happens because he starts acting the way he does and Gerda wants to go find him. If he hadn't been struck by one of the shards, she would have no reason to go find him because he wouldn't have gone missing. Like, it's likely that even if he had gotten latched on to the Snow Queen's car uh, carriage on the, on the whole sledding party thing, Gerda would have been with him because they wouldn't have been, you know, having kind of a falling out. Yep. They would still be close friends who spent all their time with each other. But... I, I do... Go ahead. No, I was going to change the subject, so go ahead. I was as well. <laughs> like, I was just going to say, like, it does make sense that, like, if your vision is distorted so you can no longer see the good in things, it does make sense that your entire outlook would become the way it does. Like, it makes sense that you would stop trusting anyone, isolate yourself, because what would be the point? If you can't see that anybody is trustworthy anymore, if you're going to be to just have to misinterpret everything that everyone does as the worst possible thing... Yeah, it's no wonder Kai started acting the way he does. If if you can see no good in the world, when that's all anybody ever tells you, like, if things are bad, just look for something good. Well, there's nothing. Not when you have the mirror shard in your eye. Yep. And that brings me to my subject that I originally wrote down for this particular conversation. So much of this story is about growing up and how the world changes around you as you age and grow and develop. And to some degree, I think Kai receiving the shards is, or at least can be interpreted as, a metaphor for for growing up and how the world looks at at that kind of perspective. And let me explain what I kind of mean. We often talk about optimism and seeing the good in things and seeing the beauty in the world in terms of childishness. It is considered childish, naive, and unwise to perceive the world as if it is beautiful and filled with good things and people are genuinely good at heart. It is considered at best silly and again childish and at worst dangerously naive and oblivious. And I think to some degree, especially with the... Okay, that's never happened before. Uh, especially with the way the story unfolds uh, in the long run, there is an argument that can be had that what we are seeing is Kai going into his adolescence, into puberty, whatever, and deciding that pretty things and good things are silly for children. And I'm going to focus on the stuff that really matters, like... <laughs> I hate you, fish. Like math and science and stuff that is real. It's not this stuff that's just pretty children's things. Being kind and nice is girly. Yeah, it kind of often I is depicted roll. that way. But that's not an uncommon picture that's painted in, in the world. That being nice to people and and expecting to see beauty in things is 
at best, going to get you hurt, and at worst, is going to get other people hurt. And that you're a fool for taking that risk. I mean, I know I've heard similar sentiments to that from people that I've spent my life around over the years. Yeah, I need to go up. I hate that. I'm gonna try and find a nice way to put this. A lot of the same crowd that tends to conflate feelings with be with girliness and kindness in that same boat are also the ones who are very careful about wanting to make sure that they raise their sons to be brave, strong, and independent, and their daughters to be obedient. I mean, so, um, you're not wrong. So I can tell them exactly what I think about that, but I can't because I don't want to get demonetized. I mean... Technically, we're not monetized yet, but we don't want to get banned. Yeah, let's just say that, uh, look how well that independence worked out for Kai. He got freaking kidnapped, and it took Gerda to come and save his butt that no one else wanted to be around because he'd been such a tool. So maybe we can take that as a lesson about the whole, there's no purpose for feelings or kindness in the world. <laughs> Jerks. And... I hate um, these and fish. I despise Castlevania fish. I despise Mario Brothers fish. <laughs> or Mario 3 fish. Ah! <laughs> I didn't even have a chance to move. But yeah, it does also it does play heavily into themes of childhood innocence, which I think we've read other things that tend to debunk that pretty handily. Though in this case, it really tries to rebuild that concept because it's often thought of children as they're innocent, they don't know any better, they're they're pure of heart. And I'm like, have you been around kids? Kids are devious. But we have that contrasted with Gerda throughout the entire story, so we can kind of take an I a look at this from that perspective. Gerda is innocent. She is kind. She is genuine in her emotions. In fact, she's painfully honest at almost all times. She's straightforward about her entire mission with everyone who asks, even when it could be potentially dangerous for her such as talking to the robber girl, she still and, like, straight up tells her, this is what I'm doing, this is what I need to do, and this is why I'm doing it. And she's so influential with people as a result of her genuineness that they're compelled to aid her. As a counterpoint to that, yes, she's unfailingly honest with everyone because of her innocence, and it gets her kidnapped twice. Once by the old woman and once by the robbers. So, yeah, um, it's I, kind of 50-50 as to how well that works out for her, I, th I think. Well, fair, but it does work out for her in the long run. Being a logically focused and uh, isolationist does not work out for Kai in any run. So, I will take Gerda's mostly wins with two losses over Kai losing everything every time. Oh yeah, no, I'm not saying pure logic is the way to go either. I'm just saying that maybe innocence isn't the complete cure-all that the, the story presents it as because, oh, absolutely again, not. Yeah. Like, there's gotta be a balance. Like That's the part about growing up, is learning to not just rely on your feelings alone, find logic, but also don't forget your emotions like compassion and what makes you human. And that's the mark of maturity, is being able to balance those two things. Using your, uh, your rational adult brain weighed with the childlike innocence that still sees the best in people to figure, I want to make the most people happy with this. I want to do what's best for everybody, so how can I make people happy in a way that's not going to cause long-term problems? Yep. 
but unfortunately it's a fairy tale and nuance is kind of hard to do in a fairy tale so we're just going with the whole hey guys maybe we shouldn't go full full hog on the enlightenment here and uh remember it's okay to be trusting sometimes yep and it's not necessarily a bad message to have but you do need that modern day nuance to it yep as they say everything in moderation Speaking of, that's probably a good place to call it. So I think with the next fish you run into, we'll be able to uh, <laughs> end the episode. There we go. See you guys next time. <laughs> Later.